The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, it's a joy to bring you God's Word this morning. Uh, This morning we're going to continue in our series here in 1 John. So if you'd turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, we're going to be reading through verses 18 through 3.3. As you're turning there, uh, you'll want to grab a seatbelt. It's actually underneath your your chairs. <laughs> We're going to be taking a ride through quite a big text here this morning. It was pretty bad, but I, I did see a few of you look under your seats. So maybe that's indicative of a Sunday morning. Here's what we're tasked with this morning as we look at this text together. We will discuss the Antichrist. We'll briefly discuss apostasy or the turning away from faith, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, what it means to be abiding in truth, this tension that's being worked out in the, in the believer's life of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility specifically in sanctification. We'll discuss the practice of righteousness, this hope and the future return of Christ, the unconditional love of God, and finally we'll look at the purifying effect of hope on the believer's life. And we'll do all of that in three hours or less. So let's, let's look at our text this morning. I'm going to read the whole section just to, just to give us the, the full picture here, and then we'll definitely we'll, we'll break it down verse by verse. So if you'd look with me at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming... Even now, many antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, little children... Abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and as such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for this time of worship, Lord. Lord, help us in this time to just unify our hearts, unify our hearts with the sole purpose of of seeing Christ, seeing more of his beauty this morning. Let that beauty transform us this morning as as your church, Lord. Please stir in us, Lord. We we can't manufacture this kind of conformity that you call us to. It's it's a work of your spirit. And so we, we just come underneath your spirit, Lord, and ask that you would stir and move 
and do the work through your word that you promise that you will do. Conform us to the image of Jesus Christ this morning, Lord. Please do a deep surgery on our hearts as we hear John's appeal, his urgency to us to remain faithful, to abide in you and in the truth based on a hope, a hope of your return. Lord, please meet us this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, then you probably understand that one of the primary themes of this epistle is a testing of genuine fellowship. Do you really have relationship with the Father is the question at stake here. And so John is taking us through various tests he has since chapter 1 to show us what true fellowship ought to look like. And as Pastor Nate Thompson pointed out last week in the text, you can know that you know him. And this isn't merely a checklist that John is taking us through. Well, I, I've done that well, I've done that well, and not well, that love thing over there, I, I don't know about that. It's not what he's doing here. This is, this is a deep heart assessment. It's not perfection, but these characteristics ought to be manifested in our lives as believers. New hearts ought to look like this, is what John is showing us. As Ken often says, it's not perfection, but direction. So is your life marked by these characteristics? Is the Spirit working in you in such a way where these things are being manifested as John is taking us through this test? Well, when you look out on the landscape of modern evangelicalism, what you see may be disheartening. There's so many that are turning their back on the faith today. I'm sure if we were to ask just even in this room if, if, everyone, if anyone knows of someone that's turned their back, I'm sure many hands would, would go up. And although incredibly difficult for those who see it happen, this really should be no surprise to us. It shouldn't. Ever since the beginning, Satan has rebelled, and there has been a God opposing evil power throughout the universe. Satan, the enemy of lives, lies, loves to deceive. He loves to see men and women confused in their faith and thus turn their back on their faith. But what ultimately is his weapon? What's his weapon? What causes this turning away and turning back to the world? Is it just from feeling disconnected or, or burnt out? Or well, maybe someone hurt me over there? Well, those may be periphery causes. I think it goes much deeper than that. And what John is going to show us this morning in this text is that ultimately what causes a turning away from the faith is a wrong view of Christ. When you boil it all down, what plagues the church today is a message that has lost its Christological focus. And Satan will throw anything into the way to clutter this message, to clutter the authenticity of this message. We've lost the pure and simple devotion to Jesus Christ in the modern evangelical church. We have, and I, when I say we, I, I speak generally of the church as a whole, and maybe more specifically the Western church. But again, this shouldn't be a surprise to us. It's easy to kind of sit up here and point the finger and say that's the problem, but it shouldn't be a surprise to us. Any great war hero knows the best way to defeat an army is to do what? To cut off the resources, the food, the water, the weaponry. Eventually, they'll wave the white flag and give in, and so it is with Satan. Go after the source. Go after the sustenance of all life in the church. Go after Christ, the vine, the head, the fountain. When Christ is removed the body will begin to turn on one another. Worldliness will make its way in and man will find his way out. And as we've been studying in 1 John, we'll see this morning that's exactly what's happening in the church. A false gospel is being proclaimed that is bringing confusion to this simple yet profound message of the gospel. And the stakes are enormous. We're talking about eternal life here. You either have fellowship or you don't. This is what it looks like to know Christ. Do you have it? That's what John is imploring us with. Now, in the case of John's writings, he's dealing with a false teaching called Gnosticism. We've seen this throughout Scripture. In fact, both Pastor Greg and Nate talked about this in detail, but just a quick review. This is the idea that matter is inherently evil and spirit is good. And thus, when you break it down, ultimately, it denies the humanity of Christ, which ultimately has major implications, as you can imagine. Substitutionary atonement, some of the fundamentals of the gospel are lost. Now, there are people today that may deny that Christ ever existed. 
Kind of a silly argument, but it exists. Gnosticism is craftier. Gnosticism says that Jesus' physical body was not real, but only seemed to be physical. It's sort of a dualistic understanding. It, it disassociates spirit from body, and what it's done is it creates, creates this, this ability to justify sin, to sin in gross measure, and that's what was happening. If my body is separate from my spirit, the physical is separate from the spirit, I can just go on sinning, and that's what's happening in the church. And so really, there should be no surprise here. People love darkness rather than light. They'll create their own Christ to appease their sinful flesh. If this false teaching gives me a way to justify my sin, then I'm, I'm all over it. I have this image, and Jackie and I have a two-year-old, well, soon to be two, his name's Hudson, and he has his stuffed animals. And I don't know why he does this. It's just something he does. He takes his stuffed animals and he kind of curls his shoulders in like this. And he kind of gets this like mischievous smile on. And, and he just kind of strokes his, his stuffed animals like this. It's, it's weird. It's a little creepy. I don't know why he does it. <laughs> but I think it, it gives us a little image into how we are with our sin perhaps, right? We, we, we kind of we curl our shoulders in. We conceal it so that others may not see it, and we keep it close, and we just sort of stroke it. And we'll create all these bubbles around us, and we'll make up our own Christ so as to appease our sinful flesh. Our sin and stuffed animals, you don't see that connected very often. <laughs> so in our passage this morning, John, in all urgency, is going to warn the believers about these false teachers. He calls them antichrists, plural. By contrasting the false teachers with true, genuine Christians. So he's going to compare and contrast the Antichrist with genuine Christians, what characterizes each. And really, that's verses 18 through 27. I'm giving it away now, but but ultimately what he says is it's our faithfulness to Christ and to the end that testifies of our genuineness, which is really where we get that sweet marriage of God's sovereign grace that sustains us and our responsibility to hold fast and to persevere. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then in verses 28 through 3.3, it's it's a glorious text about our hope as believers. And it shows us that our faithfulness is secured and motivated by our hope in the return of Christ. So the Antichrist, genuine believers, what distinguishes them? It's a faithfulness. That faithfulness is secured and motivated by our hope in Christ. Now, I acknowledge we here at Southside probably don't deal as readily with with false teachers as some others do. And although we do, we have them. We've had them come in our midst. We should never be complacent about looking out for the false teachers. But generally, it's not as frequent of an issue here. But that does not mean that we're protected from the false teachers. Okay, we live in a world where media has exploded, and as a result, you have, you have pastors that fill the pulpits with lies, and, and these messages are propagating. They're spreading all over, and we are not immune to it, which is why we must be awake. We must, with the same kind of urgency that John displays here, be ready in every hour, holding fast to Christ, holding fast to the one who has gone before us. And so John begins here in the text, if you'd look with me at verse 1. Children, again, this is John's endearing pastor's heart. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. So first he says, it is the last hour. The phrase literally is translated, last hour it is. The word order brings out the emphasis of what he's saying. And this last hour refers to the present evil age from Christ coming to his return. He says the end is at hand. There's an urgency that John is conveying here. As a result of Christ's coming, many antichrists rose up in opposition to him. This is the first occurrence of the term antichrist. John uses the singular and then the plural, saying there are many antichrists here and now, and there's a final antichrist to come. In 1 John 4, 3, he refers to these antichrists sort of as a, the spirit of the antichrist. In 1 John 4, 3, he says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. So who are the antichrists? They're false teachers who are opposed to Christ. 
The spirit of deception is made up of false teachers. They're opposed to him. They hate his message, and so they distort it. But it's not always so blunt. And I think, I think we see that probably practically and in our experience. It's not always blunt. It's rather deceptive. There may be this sweet appearance on the outside. But ultimately, when you boil it all down, these false teachers still love their sin more than they love Christ. So how might we identify these false teachers? John's going to tell us. Jude also tells us, he says, that they preach a false gospel and that false gospel is rooted in selfish gain. Here's what he says. He says, they're following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. So there's a sin of just self-absorption, consumed with self. There's no humility to these false teachers. And out of this false gospel comes dead fruit. Here's what Paul says in Titus. He says, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. And here, here's what John says. He says, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. The implications of this text are far greater than they just left the church. John is not referring to church hoppers here. This is a breaking in fellowship that John is referring to. Their connection to us was merely physical, nominal. It had no substance to it. They weren't committed to the truth. They were never attached to the vine. They never drank of the same fountain or tasted of the same sweetness of Christ. Yes, they may have listened to sermon after sermon, conference after conference. They may have closed their eyes in worship or raised their hand when the pastor said something convincing, but they were never of of us. They never had Christ. And John's words are, are bold and necessarily bold. He says they were never of us. These false teachers showed their true colors. And it's confusing for all the others, isn't it? Sometimes we may doubt, do they have something I don't have? Often these false teachers go after the weaker sheep and bring them with them. These were probably questions then that were being asked among the churches that John was ministering to. Maybe they have it right and I'm missing it. It looks so appealing to continue in the world without conviction over sin, right? Maybe they have it and I'm missing it. Well, then we have to ask the question, why God? Why why would you allow these men and women to come into our fellowship and to deceive us? Why would you allow Satan to, to cause such confusion over this beautiful message of the gospel? Could it be the same reason as 2 Corinthians 12 that God gives Paul a thorn in the flesh to produce a greater humility and trust and dependence? Don't lose heart over the fact that false teachers exist. God is sovereign over these false teachers. He's not lost his grip on the church. He promises that he will not. And even in the midst of the false teaching and the apostasy, God is showing us something about his mercy, his grace, his faithfulness. Could it be that in the midst of all of this, he's magnifying that for us, for his children, to see his mercy, his grace, his faithfulness? So what about the believer then? What about the believer? What is different? Why didn't I follow that false teaching? We'll look at verse 20. But you, believer, child of God, have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know true Christians are the opposite of Antichrist. And John, he, re- he rejoices that true believers exist Later in, in, in his second letter to these churches, he writes, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth. Later in, in 3 John, he says, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. The distinction for the Christian is that within them, they have an anointing. They have an anointing. Now, in the Old Testament, this referred to a special mark for service, right? It's a pouring of, literally, pouring of oil over the head. But, but here in this context, without a doubt, in the context of the New Covenant, it refers to the Holy Spirit. In the New Covenant, we all, as believers, are granted the Holy Spirit. He has taken up residence in our hearts, a reality that I don't know if we'll fully understand, but man, I'm so grateful for it. We have God himself dwelling within us. 
And so this is the reason we stay put. By His grace, the Spirit testifies to truth and error, and He enables us to discern. He brings to remembrance the very words of Christ. That's a promise of the Spirit. This has been one of the great revelations to me as I've read through 1 John. The Spirit is all over these pages. All over. What sustains us? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God sustains us. So this test of genuine fellowship, do you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you? He will sustain you. Earlier in John's Gospel account, he wrote in John 16, 13, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. So the Spirit testifies to the truth. He filters out the untrue from the true. And so John can speak as he does in verse 21. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. John is saying, I know you know the truth, but be aware of what is around you. No lie is of the truth. Something cannot be true and false at the same time. That might be pretty basic to us. But there are too many teachers seeking to create gray where there is no gray, to distort the the, the pure and unadulterated message of the gospel. They want there to be gray areas when truth is truth and a lie is a lie. We're continuing on in verses 22 through 23. Here are the boundaries then. Here are the boundaries. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. You can't mess with Christ is the point. You can't mess with Christ. He was there in the beginning with the Father. He was the Father's eternal delight. He perfectly manifested the glory of God, and so it was God's plan and purpose to put him on display, to exalt his Son, Jesus Christ, and yet you deny Jesus, and you think you can have the Father? It makes no sense. You can't have them both. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can't have one and not the other. You get them both. When you're preaching on the streets, maybe evangelizing, it's so often that you're, you're talking about God and the Creator, and people will usually say, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm on the same page with you. But when you get to Christ, it's like, ah, yeah, I mean, he was a man of love. I, mean, I don't know about all that narrow gate stuff over there, though. You deny Christ, you deny the whole message. You don't have the Father. Your whole building collapses. So John sets the boundaries clear. You can't have the Father if you deny Jesus. But if you confess Him as Lord, then you have the Father also. Well, John continues in verse 24 in the form of an exhortation to the believer. He says, Let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, namely the gospel. Christ has come. Look back at 1 John 1. Look back at John 1 1. The Word became flesh. The gospel hinges on this reality. Christ condescended. He stepped down out of glory, became a man, lived among us. What you have heard from the beginning, the gospel, these basic truths, don't outgrow them, I think is something we can take from this. Don't outgrow these truths. Pastor Ken often says, he says, you never outgrow the gospel, you only grow into it. Amen? You never outgrow it. You're only growing into the gospel, daily laying hold of more and more of his beauty as he transforms you. When I realized this, my whole life changed, I can remember when I was first saved and, and three years of, of running after the Lord, I'd heard the gospel, but I was so hungry for truth, and I, was just, I just need to find all the good stuff, and I was eating it up, but I was eating it up at the cost of Christ. Now, it's not bad to desire to, to learn and to grow, but if you, miss, if you leave the gospel behind, you, you miss it all. You lose it all. Four years ago, I, I met Pastor Ken at a Panera Bread. We sat down. There was nothing extravagant about what he said to me. He, he showed me Christ. He brought me back to to Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I mean, truly, that's that's what I needed. It was water to a parched soul. We can't can't miss the sweetness of Christ. We can't ever lose the sweetness of the gospel. The means by which we will remain faithful is a constant abiding in the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's our means. 
Don't let the gospel lose its sweetness. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. In other words, if the gospel is the anchor of your soul, then you will find yourself clinging to Christ. This is a continual abiding. It's a continual abiding. Keep being anchored. The word abide here literally means to remain. Hold fast. Cling to the truth of that which you heard from the beginning of the gospel. Have you, have you drifted from Christ and Christ crucified this morning? Hear the Spirit through this text. Don't, don't forsake Christ. Hear John's urgency. The stakes are eternal life. That is the prize. Hold it fast. Hang on to it. Meditate day and night. Abide in it. Keep it at the forefront of your mind. Set your mind on those things above, not on the things of earth. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Let it change how you view trial and tribulation and challenges. Let the truth permeate you. I think it's what John is saying. Let the, the, the truth of the gospel permeate your very soul. And so John shows us one of the, the primary distinctions between a Christian and a false teacher is that the Christian will abide. They will persevere. And this is perhaps our first glimpse into that great paradox in the, the Christian faith here in this text that we are called to persevere Christian will persevere in in, in John's gospel in chapter 10, verse 28. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And yet, at the same time, and later in this text this morning, he commands us to persevere. So you will abide by the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet he also commands us to abide. This is a tension that we see throughout the Bible, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Some may say that our obedience to God reveals the reality that this truth abides in me, it lives in me, it, is, it has my heart. Don't be deceived then, verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Don't be deceived by those seeking to deceive us with anything but the truth and the simplicity, the purity of the gospel. Don't be deceived by them. And yet also don't miss the promise wrapped up in this text here in verse 27. Christians will remain to the end. You have this anointing which you received from him who abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Well, it just said we don't need anyone to teach us so we can just close our Bibles and be done, right? Done for the day. No. That's to miss it. That's to miss what he's trying to say here. Please hear the heart of John in this text. If, if, if you think that's what he's saying, go read Ephesians 4. Right? The analogy of faith says Scripture interprets Scripture. We can't, we can't think that this means I don't need teaching anymore. And the Gnostics believed that. They were leaving the church. They believed that they received a special sort of inspiration from the Holy One, whatever that was to them. And He had a special knowledge, a special ability. That's not it. We need teaching. But instead, what John is showing for us is he's showing the sufficiency of God's word. He's saying, don't rely on man-centeredness or empty words, but on God's word and on the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit in us. We have what we need right here in the pages of Scripture. And again, eternal life is at stake here. When you attach yourself to God's word or the gospel, you are attaching yourself to Christ, and in so doing, you are promised eternal life. The false teachers don't know eternal life because they never attach themselves to Christ. They created their own Christ to fit their own agenda. And so John, thus far, he's contrasted the Antichrist with the believer, showing us that the believer will hold fast and will remain faithful by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, and now he directs our attention to a hope, to a hope our hope as believers, as children of God. And again, the purifying, securing, motivating effect of hope on the believer's life. For the believer, we have hope. Something this world cannot possibly comprehend unless they have Christ. We have a hope. And everyone in this world looks for hope, don't they? When you, just, when you look out, everyone's looking for hope in something. Right? Whether it be that, that, that wife or that husband, or that career, or that house, or a car. Maybe it's something more temporal. I, I, 
I have hope in the weekend to come or the vacation to come, or maybe it's just the end of the day. It's, we're, we're wired in such a way to hope. We have hope. People are always looking for hope. There was an experiment done. Someone brought it to my attention. I read about it this week. An experiment done by a guy named Kurt Richter. And it was an experiment on rats. So we're bringing it down a level here, quite a degree. But in the 1950s, he performed an experiment called the Hope Experiment. And this was, this was fascinating. In this experiment, he took lab rats and he put them in a pot of water. And he let them swim in this water for as long as they possibly could and struggle and eventually they would drown to death and they were defeated. It's a morbid story. It has a point to it. Um, But the average time before a rat would indeed drown was 15 minutes. Well, then he took another set of lab rats and he did the very same thing. And just as they began to struggle and, and in defeat sort of sink down to the bottom, he'd grab that rat, he'd pull them out, he'd rub them dry and he'd let them catch their breath for a few minutes. Then he'd take that same rat and he'd put them back into the water and he'd let them swim and he'd see how long they would swim for. It was remarkable what he found. He found that those rats that were, uh, I gotta find myself in my notes, those rats who had been removed for just that short time, a few minutes, out survived their initial effort by 240 times. They swam for nearly three days, 60 hours, because they had hope. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable, but the point is, we all have Hope. There's a difference, of course, between us and a rat, but I think it still exists. We all have hope. There's that hope that unites us, and yet the difference between a Christian and an unbeliever is that our hope is eternal. It's sure, it's steadfast. It does not vacillate or change with the world, it's not temporal. It will find its end, of course, its realization, its consummation when we get to glory. But we have a sure and steadfast hope, one that's immovable. That's the difference. John MacArthur describes hope in this way. He says, The concept of spiritual hope is analogous to turning on a blazing light in a dark place. It immediately illuminates one's outlook, uplifts the soul, and produces joy in the heart. Hope introduces life and happiness into the sin-stained and death-filled world. What a great testament to the goodness of God that he would give us hope. Isn't that amazing? He gives us hope in this dark world. Hope for a future with Christ. Romans eight twenty two through 25, if you want to turn there. This is a great text dealing with our hope. Romans eight twenty two through 25. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hebrews six nineteen through 20, you can turn there too if you'd like. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hope. It's a part of the believer's army, uh, armor. We're told of the helmet, the hope of salvation. With hope, we can endure the most difficult circumstances. It's a remedy for the despairing whole soul. In Psalm 42, twice the psalmist writes, Why are you so downcast, O my soul, and why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise Him. Hope motivates us. It motivates us in missions and ministry. Adoniram Judson, the great missionary to Burma, said this, In spite of sorrow, loss, and pain, our course be onward still. We sow on Burma's barren plain, we reap on Zion's hill. With hope we can face anything, anything. I mean, just think about it. We have a hope. We have a hope in this life. And it comes from the Spirit of God. I love this, Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And it's this hope that we're going to be told purifies us. It purifies those who possess, who possess it, and it shows that they are indeed Christians. That's where this text is taking. So, so look with me at verse 28. If you're looking for an outline for this next section, you may look at it this way. Verses 28 through 29 speak about we are born of him. Verse 1, we belong to him. Verses 2 through 3, we will become like him. So we're born of him, we belong to him, and we will become like him. And this all relates, again, to our faithfulness as true, genuine believers. Look at verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. That's verse 29. We know John is introducing a new section because of the use of the particle now. He's, he's defining for us a hope that marks every true believer. And, and he says again, he says, abide in him. This is clearly a favorite description of John's to emphasize perseverance. Of course, we've already seen it a number of times. The difference, however, between his use here and what he used even in verse 27 is that John commands it. John commands it. The command verifies the fact that abiding is not passive. Our abiding or remaining is not characterized by idleness, but rather growing, deepening this relationship of faith and trust. It's marked by a practice of righteousness. It's an active pursuit. And don't forget the tension point here. We, we, we are commanded to persevere, and yet it's Christ who holds us, us fast. John Piper says this. He says, he says, what Christ bought for us when he died was not freedom from having to hold fast, but the enabling power to hold fast. Enabling power to hold fast. Don't move away from him, John is saying. Stay near to him so that when he appears, when he returns, we may have confidence. We may have confidence. The word translated means outspokenness or freedom of speech. It's also used in Hebrews 4.16, and it refers to our boldness as we approach the throne of grace. Here it indicates an assurance that we can have based on our abiding in him. We can have confidence, he says. We can have confidence. And this is a great contrast to the unbeliever. So if you look at 28b, the unbeliever shrinks away from him in shame at his coming. The mask of hypocrisy finally wears thin and the true nature is exposed. No mask will withstand the glory of God when it appears, when Christ comes the roots will be uprooted that we're not rooted in Christ. And we're told every knee will bow. Will you bow in humble admiration at the one who made you? Or will you shrink back ashamed because you loved your sin more than you loved the Savior? That's what's at stake here. That's what John is saying. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. Confidence or shrinking back. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. I think it was Ricky Anderson who said, abide in readiness by abiding in righteousness. This hope that John is identifying for us is manifested in righteousness. We prove this hope to be real by our living. Now, John uses two different forms of the word no here. The first form is oida. It gives the idea of perceiving an absolute truth. The second use is gnosko, one we probably are familiar with, and it's an experiential knowledge. It's an experiential knowing. Upon knowing that God is righteous, you may know by experience that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And this is how we are identified in this world. This is how we're identified in the world. This is how we will stand out as, as those who have been bought with a price. Based on our righteous living, they will see you stand out. There will be a saltiness. There's something different motivating that heart. You have a new nature. You have a new nature. God has touched your life. It says you've been born of him, born with a new vision, a new purpose, a new identity. You're a child of God now. That's where John takes us. I love how when you're reading scripture, sometimes you get these, these outbursts. From, from the writers, and, and sometimes it's an outburst of, you, you just think the Spirit's attending to them, and, and, and just, they, they, they almost pour it out, just how great the love the Father has bestowed on us, I think is an outburst from John here. 
He's at the end of his life and he's thinking on the resurrection to come and here's what comes. It just bleeds out of him. Some commentators even say verses 1 through 3 of chapter 3 should have parentheses around them. They're almost, a, again, this, this outburst of awe. See what kind of love the Father has bestowed on us. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. That we would be called children of God and such we are. That's what he says. See how great, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Most, most other translations at, m- more accurately read, see what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. See what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. They actually exclude the adjective because it's excluded in the Greek. This is a rarely used term that really has no English parallel. It's the same term used in Matthew by the disciples when they see Jesus still the waves. They say, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Right? It's, it's a reaction of astonishment, amazement. The, the adjective is excluded that, that we might fill it in in exclamation. See what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Words can't comprehend. Words can't comprehend this unique love of God. And it's this unique love of God that is the very foundation of our hope. We can have hope because of this kind of love. God has loved me with an unmatched love. That's what this verse is telling us. This is a love that, whereby he takes all the initiative. He takes all the initiative. We couldn't have chosen our adoption. I mean, I mean think about that. We, we couldn't. We didn't choose our adoption. God set his love on us, and that's it. It's kind of a Deuteronomy 7, Right? It wasn't because we were some majestic, great, big, large people, and speaking of Israel, I set my love on them. I set my heart upon them. Revelation 1.5, and John says it later, he says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, to him be glory forever. This isn't, a, this isn't a kind of love that's, hey, Dad, I, I scored a, a goal in soccer. Well, I guess I'll still love you, son. It's not that kind of love, right? It's not a love of response. It's a love of initiative. He's adopted me into his family, and he's given me a new name for no reason but that his heart is upon me. Is there any better name to be called than a child of God? It carries with it a new nature, a new birth, new identity. There's no greater name. There's no greater name than to be called a child of God. What a blessing. We are children of God. And the text says the world does not know us because it did not know him. The world does not know us because it did not know him. We are, we are just aliens and sojourners passing through. Our gaze is on something far greater, far greater than this world can possibly grasp. And I don't say that in some elitist kind of way. I say that as one who drank of the the sewage of this world for 19 years. 19 years and then I drank the sweetness of Christ. I tasted of him, the sweet fountain of living water and everything changed. I know many would testify to that very thing even as David Chambliss was praying. When we're drinking of sewage and we drink of Christ, man, you know, you know there's something so much sweeter. There's something so much sweeter. The world doesn't know us. The world, the world doesn't understand that when I'm driving, I can speak out loud and know that God hears me, right? The, the world doesn't get that. They don't understand that I can sit down and eat my eggs and bacon and drink my orange juice to the glory of God, and I don't do that perfectly. Don't, don't, don't hear me wrong, but I'm just saying that they don't understand that. They don't understand that the Spirit now dwells within us as children of God, and testifies to God. When we look out on the mountains or we look at the sunset or we see the changing colors of fall right now, we can put a name to those things as children of God. The world doesn't understand that. The world doesn't understand that as the Spirit now lives within me and as I stand here even this morning and as we sing songs that He he stirs our affections and we can worship Him. The world doesn't understand that. I think that's what John is saying. They don't understand this love that we have been loved with, this anointing that we have now by the Spirit and the faithfulness that we now are promised in the gospel. They don't understand. They just don't. Verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as what we will be. What we are is not known by the world, not yet known by the world, and what we will be is not yet known by us. 
But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. This is the climactic transformation for the believer because this right here isn't it. Hope is intended to reach its final consummation, its final realization, and we know that it is to come when Christ returns. We're in process right here. We're in process. I haven't fully put it on. But the promise here, we will be like him fully. In his coming will be our completion, likeness to Christ. All that you hope for will be answered when Christ returns. He's the only sure and steadfast hope. Have you put your hope on anything else? On any lesser thing? It's been said that imitation is the highest form of praise. And so our transformation will glorify Christ by showing that he is the all in all. Philippians 3.21, for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Is your hope on anything less than Christ? This will carry you. It's what you've longed for all your life is what he's telling us if, if we would just believe it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, believe this truth perfect union with Christ is all we've longed for. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. When our hope is on him, he is the object of our hope. There is a greater desire to become like him now. When Christ is the example, he's the goal of your life. To fix your hope on Christ is to emulate him, to walk in obedience to him. Paul said it this thing, this way, one thing I do One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward, stretching his neck, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Grace will move that way in us as we set our hope. An informed hope will make us those who love purity. It will. It must. What has this blessed hope produced in you? Is it resulting in purification, Christ-likeness? If not, maybe you've placed your hope on something else, something lesser. This is, a, this is your, your opportunity to examine your heart. Am I living a life of purity because my hope has been set on Christ? Put your hope in Christ. Start living in purity now. Beware lest you be found having fallen asleep. There's, there's no time left. There's an urgency that Paul is telling, uh, telling us right here. It's the last hour. It is the last hour. Is this hope so manifested in your life that you are living day by day with great assurance? Abiding in the truth, clinging to the gospel in all of its purity. We can be confident when he returns. No other religion can claim such a thing because they take justification and they put it after sanctification. If I've done enough, maybe I'll be justified before God. We can be confident right here and now what this text is telling us. And it's not because, well, I've had a good run reading my Bible lately, or I haven't looked at porn for a while, or, or I've, I've been, my communication in my marriage has been really good lately. That's not our confidence. Our confidence is in the unchanging, undivided, unmixed, unstained, perfect one of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is your hope in him? Have you attached yourself truly to the vine? Dead branches can't bear fruit. You attach yourself to the vine. Alistair Begg said this. He said, abide in him this morning so that when you hear the trumpet sound, your first response as a child of God may be, Father, Father. Would that be all of our responses? When we hear that trumpet sound, it could be today. Father, Father. So what characterizes genuine fellowship in closing? What characterizes genuine salvation? That's the question at stake here. A faithfulness to the end, even in the midst of all the arrows coming at us, even in the midst of all the false teachings that are out there. A faithfulness to the end because of a hope founded and rooted in Jesus Christ. That's the point here. So let's pray.
Father, uh, we just come to you this morning, Lord, with humble hearts. God, asking that we would indeed be those that bow in humble admiration. Humble admiration to the, the one who became flesh and lived among us and went to a cross and died in our place and bore all the wrath of God upon himself, every last drop that we may have, therefore, forgiveness and no condemnation because of Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that he gives us his righteousness and he plants within us a hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us, God, to please place our hope on him. And if we are, if we are those who have placed it on anything less, marked by disobedient lives, lives that really are cavalier with sin and don't care about righteousness, Lord, humble us and we come in repentance, Lord, and ask that you may, again, fix our hope on Christ. Lord, by your spirit, fix our hope on Jesus Christ this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.